Hey, I'm Max O'Connor, and I'm sitting here with Velvet and Zach Kelm, two huge players in the music industry. No, no shaking your head. No, we know, we know it's true. It's all right. Uh, Velvet's in charge of the Media Collective, a huge PR firm here in Nashville, and Zach with Q Management Group. Yep. Yep. Another iconic management group here in the Nashville area with several great artists on it. Let's uh, let's dive right in. You guys doing all right? Doing great. Yeah. Thanks for joining us on the show today. Need more coffee? I know we can make that happen for you. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sipping on mine, and I'm just like, okay, I need a little more to get my day going. This has been a, it's been an early morning today. Yes. It feels good. So let's just jump right in. Okay. Let's start talking about how you guys got into music. What was the first dollar that you guys made in music? And you can answer together. However, you guys want to go back and forth. Go ahead. Dollar. The first dollar you mm-hmm. made in music. Um, I was hired in PR okay. at Star Song Records by Jeff Mosley. Okay. And he, um, I would, had been doing a summer internship and I had transferred from a school in Oklahoma to Belmont and he hired me actually here. Now that I think about it, he hired me part-time It's kind of during the internship and then it became full-time after I graduated. So that's that would, that would be when I earned Jeff, the first dollar. That's awesome. Jeff yeah. Mosley. The name brings me back to the day. Yep. That's awesome. Great and, guy. And you yes. still work around him some, right? Yeah, we still do a lot of stuff with, with his label, with yeah. Fairtrade. Trade. Yeah. Because you guys have Mercy Me, right? Yep. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about you, my friend? I won't repeat my story since I kind of gave some of it last <laughs> time, but uh, I was a college promoter mm-hmm. at, a, at a little uh, liberal arts school in Missouri and uh, came here to work for a manager in uh, 1997. And that was my first dollar. The, the first dollar. would have been uh, April, May of, of 07. All right. Yeah. That's incredible. So what what was it after those first dollars were made in music? What Was there like a turning point that then enabled you to go full time, like just fully immersive into music? I know with you guys being more on the business side of things, sometimes there's a clear path defined for right. you, whereas some artists it's like, well, I was a guitar player and then... Oh, suddenly, you know, I was picked up by, you know, a publishing company or whatever. But was there a a turning point that enabled you guys to just go full-time music's all you're doing? Yeah, for me, when I graduated college, I moved here uh, almost straight away. Mm -hmm. And so the moment I showed up here and started my first week on the job, and being on the business side, it's more clear-cut. You're either on Mm -hmm. a payroll or you're you're contract label on part-time or you're not. So so for me, when I showed up that first week, I think in May of 07... It was full time from that point on. That's awesome. So yeah, for me it was probably similar. I was being part part time for the entire senior year of college, and then when I graduated, they hired me full time. So that's awesome. It was full steep, full speed ahead. <laughs> so and we don't often get many husband and wife power couples on here. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about how how you guys came together and what's do you guys work together a good bit? I know we've worked with stuff that both right. of you have been involved with. What's it like, you know, kind of working in the industry as as a couple, but as you know, people with two powerful companies? We love it. I, yeah, that's yeah. great. I mean, I think we're fortunate. We like being around each other, so you know, <laughs> we are married. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, some people, even if they have a great marriage, couldn't work in. You know, be around each other twenty four seven. Yeah, just yeah. Our out. companies so. work out of the same space. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, you know, we do it together every day. So it is the sense that we're in the same room every yeah. day twenty four seven. Was so. there was there anything you guys did to kind of like was there complications with that initially? Because I mean, it's no, no. I mean, it was it was probably the most different for me because you had when you started Q at yes. least you worked out of your house. I had always had an office, mm-hmm. and so I was not sure how that was going to feel when we first merged in or merged in the space sense and shared space. So it's all David it Smallbone's fault. <laughs> it's great. David, if you're watching this, see what happens. So talk, talk to me. What, what, what did David do with this? Well, when I, when I graduated college and, mm-hmm. and uh, went to work for David, mm-hmm. we worked in, in his house. Okay. So his office was literally uh, a couple bedrooms at that time. Yep. And eventually we grew out of that and, and moved into an office space. But for most of the time that I worked for him, we worked out of his house. Man. So So it's become a kind of a comfort zone. Yeah, that's right. Like, you know, at that point, it, it, you know, they lived on a farm and and I'll never forget one of the funniest stories that we, we were at a Thanksgiving thing with them and we had to leave because we have young kids and we didn't have a babysitter that could stay but they were like hey tell some of your fun stories from back in the day and so I didn't get the chance to tell mine but I'll tell it now uh, so one of my 
craziest and most fun stories when I worked there is that it was in the house and they had a farm. So they had chickens like going everywhere. So yeah. you'd be on, you know, someone on the other side of the world who thinks you're setting in, you know, music row uh, yeah. office and right outside is a rooster crowing and, and mm-hmm. you know, whatever going on. And so I'll never forget we had a promotions guy, a guy named Tim Cardacia. Mm-hmm. And uh and, and he, he kind of he kind of did promotions and such for uh, tours, and one day he just I bad day I don't know I just remember he turned all red in the face and he was like I have had enough and he goes storming out of the room out the back door and I look out the window and Cardacious chasing the chickens <laughs> around the yard and to this day I still remember it because he just had enough of hearing the oh chickens outside his office. That's insane. But those are fun times. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I can vouch, chickens are horrifying. My dad, <laughs> when we moved to Arkansas from St. Louis, it was very much that way. There was suddenly wildlife I didn't know right. existed in areas where there was people living. <laughs> and, yeah, it was a uh, – roosters crowing is a real thing. Yeah. And they do it far earlier than you think But what's would. really funny is that, you, you know, David's David's daughter was a gold-selling artist at yeah. that point. And you know, David's chickens. kind of a – you know, he's been in management for a long time. He's he's had many successful clients and, 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 and family members who became successful – Someone on the other side of the phone would have never known that we were sitting in yeah. a bedroom with chickens <laughs> on the other side of the wall. That's what's really funny about it. I love it. it. All. So, so it, what what I was really excited about talking to you guys about is that you guys work on a side of the business where it's it's more of a mystery to up and coming like artists and writers, like especially today with social media and like trying to build your own brand. That's like a hard thing for a lot of aspiring musicians and, and artists to kind of you know, grasp, you know, the the importance of having followers and interacting with your audience and engaging your audience. So can you guys kind of tell us or tell our viewers how each of your different, you know, professions helps artists in that aspect or what you can do for artists as they're coming up? Like, why would they need to seek out management or PR? You're better to go first. <laughs> um, well, I think PR is, is key in, in kind of, in comp- in comp- I can't talk. Do you edit these? Like, yeah, there's it, it, light chopping here <laughs> okay. and there. You know? um, I think it's key in kind of encapsulating what it is you want to say, what you, how you want your message to get out there when you are not singing mm-hmm. or performing, you know, or and sometimes when you are because you're, you know, talking as well. But um, I think PR can help kind of define the brand in some ways, um, the message. It's there's so many outlets and avenues that you can go down. It can kind of help diversify it to an audience yeah. who you are. Um, so I think it's a huge part of kind of creating who you are and what you want people to see and know about you. Are there steps that artists and writers and stuff like that can be taking to like prepare themselves for working with people like yourself? Like, Are there initial things you would look for in people coming to you for help? That you'd be like, I'd love for this to be kind of the foundation to build off of. Like, what what can they be doing proactively to kind of est- help establish for themselves? Us, so much of it is a story. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, that's where it always starts. And whether you're an independent artist or you are, you know, on a major, it's all about the story. Yeah. So it's having something to talk about beyond just, you know, my socials are huge or, yeah. you know, whatever. I have a hit song. That's obviously great. But um, what is it you're trying to say? What are your life experiences? What creates the story of who you are, who your band is? Yeah. So to us, that's where it starts. Yeah. So because like pictures of your dinner can only go so far, right. be- you know, before it's like, yeah. oh, there needs to be a little more. Yeah. What are you passionate about? What's what what pushes you? What drives you? What's gotten you to where you're at so far? Do you have advice for people that are trying to find that in themselves? Like. I know we've talked to some, you know, writers that are like, oh, you know, for me, the way I discovered my voice was like going and just abstractly writing for 20 minutes and just like pouring thought out continuously and just kind of seeing. Like, do you, when when you're working with artists, are there exercises they can be doing to kind of like help focus in on what their message is or, or their thought process behind writing and stuff like that? I mean, I, don't, I can't really speak to the songwriting part of it mm-hmm. as much. Um, 
that's not really my department. But even just as artists <laughs> but, developing their own yeah. story and stuff, or their you know their vision for what they want to do with I their mean, career. I mean, it is where if they're writers, it is where the songs come from. Or mm-hmm. if it's not even their song, but you know what inspired them to want to record that song. Yeah. You know what 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 in that. Where did you find yourself in that? Yeah. You know, um, you know, how did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Um, or depending on your age, you know, college or other life experiences, um, yeah. relationships, just kind of all of it. You yeah, know, yeah. like think through what is it that makes you tick and why Why are you here? Mm-hmm. Not just here as an artist, but here, yeah. period. That's awesome. You know? Yeah. And, in, and then from the management side, we... we coalesce yeah. all of those the aggregate of all of those things together and help an artist and, and you know managers can manage writers as well and and help them you know build whatever platforms or goals that they want to accomplish so managers will take you from being on an island you know if you started out by yourself and then helping put the team around you and and the strategies or whatever it is you're trying to ultimately accomplish we help put the puzzle pieces together mm-hmm. to make them all fit and and the landscape be clearer then. So so in the years that you guys have been working in this industry, how has the landscape kind of changed based on where you guys began when you first entered to where it is now? Because with all the streaming and all of that, dramatic. artists coming up are just right. like, they're so confused with what they need to be doing. Like, do I need to make a record or do I need to just be pushing stuff out like every few months or every right. you know couple of weeks or... You know, it's yeah, just it's, like, it's, how do you guys kind of keep up with it, and how has it changed for for you guys? Oh, yeah, I was just literally saying yesterday, I can't even recall who I was meeting with, um, but we were just talking about when I started, you know, 20-something years ago, you know, everybody, you would have a major that would have lots of imprints that were all encompassed into a major. Um, so if it was Warner Music Group, then then you had Electra, and you, you, you go down the line, Atlantic, you had all of the yeah. different... And each of those had full-fledged promotional marketing, digital. Digital didn't necessarily exist in the same way at that mm-hmm. time, but they all had full-fledged teams. Yeah. Well, with with Napster and all the things that ensued after that, you basically had imprints that all folded into whatever the major in that they wanted yeah. to to consolidate. Everything cons- consolidated into one, as well as all of those teams consolidated. So it used to that each team would have its full, you know, uh, personnel that worked those individual genres or artists. Um, And now the same team is working many times. The same team is working or parts of the same team are working the different imprints that still have uh, rights to those artists and, and working those artists. And so for managers... Um, at least in my in my field, it's meant that we many times end up doing uh, a lot of that front end work. You know, um, I'm not saying that that labels aren't developing because they certainly yeah. are. Uh, you know, there, there's certainly labels doing development, but there's a fine line between finding that space that a label is ready to jump in. That there's enough happening. That there's enough development already happened. That they then can put their resources that they have behind it. I'm finding that management companies and teams are building more of that today to the place that a major steps in. Mm-hmm. Whereas in, in the past, because you had lots of teams uh, with, with you know full operations happening, more bandwidth, yeah. y- you could bring a, a more introductory level artist with maybe not as much happening at that point, but the building blocks were there. You could see that that they could write hit songs. You know all the things that we look at on, on both sides of the fence. Today, you 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 you've got to go a little bit further in before uh, you can get there. Was so, that a skill set you kind of had to evolve as you as it's been like progressing over the years? Yeah, I think I think ultimately all of us just kind of lean into yeah. as, as things change. I, I, you know, sometimes you're on the front of things and sometimes you're leaning in because yeah. th- there's no choice other yeah, yeah. than to lean in, okay, this is how it's going. I, I've got to adapt and move towards that. Um, so yeah, I would I would say yeah that that ultimately happened as you know, both of us have been doing this for a while as we saw you know, lots of teams and, and friends start moving out of the business, doing yeah. completely different things, uh, and realizing, okay, this is consolidating for this period of time. Yeah. We've got to figure out how to work in this landscape. 
So, yeah, I mean, we've even seen around here just as we were talking before we even started filming this thing, just like moving into video stuff and just trying to consolidate as many services under one right. umbrella as possible to just help artists, you know, push their vision outward. Right. It's become like music is such a such a gray area now that mm -hmm. there's like there's no definition of like this Correct. is exactly what it is now. It's, it's a wild wild yeah. west. Yeah. There's no clear it used to be there was a much more clear path on yeah. how you could on ramp something. Yeah. Now it's happening across multiple different platforms and in, in ways you wouldn't have necessarily known to have thought about 20 years ago. Yeah. Mm. So. And we uh we were talking with some some guys working in the sync world and mm. you know like music directors and stuff like that and they were talking about as we, as we were mentioning socials earlier how important like just that is to people like looking at music direction and stuff like that for for television and all that because mm -hmm. they look at the numbers and they're like well two songs they're kind of equal in our eyes we'll pay the same amount for each whatever mm -hmm. this person has a hundred thousand followers so that's pretty much a hundred thousand free ads if we put their song in this or whatever and this song's just as fine but it has like 800 followers on the right. account so it's just shocking how it like it can just break down that far it was right. like just the importance of building up those things. So, mm -hmm. for you, how how has it kind of changed for you as it's as this, especially with social media, just yeah, like I mean, exploding? Yeah, is, is drastically changed, just like everything else. I mean, even just from how you how we pitch or how we communicate. I mean, I remember faxing, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like <laughs> actually calling people. And not that we don't call people now, but you know, everything is so much more email, you know, instant, you know, Facebook messages. Um, texting it's you know it's so drastically different now how you communicate and there's more ways to communicate than there was before but it's more jumbled yeah now too and kind of getting people's attention through all that communication is challenging yeah um so you know we used to actually physically mail product too and now you know we still mail it sometimes but most of the time it's digitally sent as well so um and the outlets have changed a lot. You know, I mean, there's hardly any print outlets anymore. Um, there are some still, but you know, you used to have to work way ahead of time because their lead time was six months, you know, or more. Mm -hmm. Now, with the most everything being digital, it's you know, a couple months out at yeah. the most. You know, so yeah. th that's all changed. Um, you know, what hasn't changed is that you still need a good story. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, a lot of times what helps you get through the muddle. Mm -hmm. You know, um, good music obviously helps too. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, pretty much everything else has changed. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, talking about cutting through the noise and, and all the muddle, are there specific places up-and-coming artists should be focusing, like, their their energies? Because, like, like we are saying, there's so many different aspects of everything now. Do you Have you guys mm -hmm. seen things that are working specifically for artists you're, that you guys are working with that, like, these avenues seem to be more effective for cutting through the noise rather than just, like, spreading yourself completely thin and trying to, you know, lightly touch in all these different aspects? I mean, socials are right. the main thing. Have you seen any social, like, anyone that's specifically better like i know there's some people that just really love instagram rather than twitter or you know facebook with the facebook live aspect but now mm -hmm. i guess instagram's putting their own live right. twist on it are there any that you know the reach is better or that you guys you know get into analytics or anything like that i know we as a company we're just always like oh who, who's watching what when's this connecting with who and it's mm -hmm. just like if we're just a production company i can't imagine what it's like for an artist yeah. that, like, this is your immersed life. Like, not only do you have to create, but you have to sit here and be like, they watched for 37 seconds. This person watched for that. <laughs> no, like, what do I have to do? You to do. You can speak to that better. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think m most of the time, depending on what level of artist and where their socials are at, mm -hmm. they can tell, you know, how many how many retweets are they getting? How, how many people are commenting back to them? Yeah. Yeah, they can kind of tell which platform is connecting in what they're doing. Yeah. Um, most of my artists, you know, when they put something out, they'll recognize, okay, hey, you know what? I was really getting a response to this yeah. on this particular platform. And that changes, as mm -hmm. we all know. Like, Facebook was king, and, you know, you yeah. go back, all the MySpace used to be king, yeah, sure. you know? So the, the, there are platforms that kind of come and go, and, and those seasons can also bring, like, renewed effort or, or energy in that platform. And, and, and so you end up kind of moving into that as its king for the moment. Um, but but ultimately, I think artists end up, you know, because it's their story, yep. 
and it, and it's people resonate with that story, and so they react to it, yeah. and they can kind of get a gauge of. And of course, we see it as well. I'm not saying that we don't notice because we yeah, do, yeah. Yeah. but they know because they get the responses back. Yeah. Um, you know, so for me, what I would say is is that um, obviously socials are important, um, and then you know, there's 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 all these new on ramps that didn't exist, like in what Spotify's doing now. Mm-hmm. You know, and their and their emerging artist kind of platforms and in the new music kind of platforms. You know, if if you can create uh, quality music, and if you can create the um, you know the the kind of social uh, buzz that needs to happen to allow you, yep. then there is a way now. Uh, there's platforms now that exist for that music to get found before you have a label or a manager or any of those things, and you can be you know, some artist or some band in, you know, n- middle of nowhere and suddenly everybody in the industry is noticing because it starts working on a platform that didn't exist before. So that's just one example. No, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's great. So let's jump in now. We're going to hit into what we call the full circle five, which is kind of like a rapid fire thing, but it doesn't have to be super rapid. You can, <laughs> you can answer as thoroughly as you want to. But it's just five questions we ask everybody. Right. So first question is, is there a book or a record that you recommend to everybody? I, uh, for me, there's probably a few. Um, so I'm a huge Garth Brooks fan. Okay. Um, I've loved his music pretty much from when all of America and the world started hearing about him. So for me, no fences. Going, you know, back to some of his early music is yeah. is one of the you know one of the records. I mean, I like pretty much every record he put out. Yeah. Um, but that was kind of the record for me that I can just remember. Remember being in high school, uh, me and me and uh, one of, I have this one memory of one, one of my best friends in high school is a guy named Bobby Fort. And I remember he and I laying on the trampoline in the middle of the summer, uh, listening to No Fences, probably singing it to the top of our lungs. I don't recall <laughs> that part. But for me, that was one of those records. Um uh, from a book standpoint, there's been a few like years ago. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell did The Tipping Point, yeah. which was a just a really formative book for me and in kind of what was happening in in some of my clients' careers at that point. We really leaned in to that kind of um, you know the, the thought process of yeah. his book. Um, a friend of mine wrote a book recently. I'm not completely finished with it, but I've loved it. Uh, called Good Faith, mm-hmm. and uh, really. It's a really great read. Um, a few years ago, Francis Chan wrote the book Crazy Love, yeah. which really loved that book. So there's a few. Uh, music, um, there's probably not just one for me. Um, I was the one like in high school and college and stuff that would always force people into my car and make them listen to stuff, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, I would I mean, there's so many. Um, I would say Unforgettable Fire, mm-hmm. U2. Yeah. That was my first real concert as well. Um, but just, you know, talk about a band who who knows who they are, yeah. you know, and made amazing music. So, and they're still at it, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely one for sure. I was an 80s girl, though, so, you know. <laughs> Def Leppard, yep. Thompson Twins, Duran Duran, all that. That's yeah. awesome. So, all that, you know, not a whole lot of, you know, deep, other than you too, not a yeah. whole lot of necessarily deep thinking stuff there. But, yeah, but it's rock and roll, it. you know. Come on. Do you have it. any books, favorite books you'd um, recommend? Since having kids, I haven't read hardly anything. Um, <laughs> but Crazy Love would definitely be impactful mm. for me too. Yeah. Because um, that really can affect every aspect of your life, obviously. So, um that probably that might be the last full book I actually read. <laughs> I wish I didn't say that, but that's true. No, so. I, I hear you. <laughs> Audible has been my saving grace because yeah. I live like 40 minutes from here. So, you right. know, at the end of the day, it's like I, my ears need a little break right. from the music. So, yeah, I've been Malcolm Gladwell's been yeah. I've been going through all of his stuff. Tipping point, yeah. you know, outliers, all right. that stuff. It's just it's nice to get a couple, you know, 40 minutes of a little, you know, little education right. or something mm-hmm. and a little inspiration. Um, which will move us into our next question. So here at Full Circle, we talk a lot, you know, at our academy and everything about 
learning from not just mentors, but mistakes as well. And, you know, failure is kind of a weird word because while it has a negative connotation, it can ultimately be a gift if you've learned something from, you know, from the failure that you've experienced. So do you guys have any favorite failures that you've had something that's happened to you that was maybe not great, but in the end you learned something and it was able to change, you know, your momentum for the positive? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think many times some of our life circumstances and the failures in that that aren't necessarily at the time you don't realize is like a business failure. Yeah. But but in that, it changes the direction of your life, which in turn changes the direction of your business. Yeah. Um, and I've had many of those. And, and hindsight's always twenty twenty. Yeah. So in the time, you're like, oh my gosh, what does this mean? Yeah. And later you look back and you realize that out of your woundedness, if it, if it was a wound, or or out of your failure came new life, you know, came this new direction. The, the failure caused you to pivot into something that you either, one, chose, or two, had no choice over. Um, and so for me, there's been a couple of those in just life things that have happened. And in, in retrospect, I realized, okay, at the time, that was not pleasant. I had yeah. no idea what was happening. But it really changed, it pivoted my whole life. Um, and, and so I think of two, you know, before I was even in the industry, um, uh, I, I came from, so all the things that I, I've developed that, that have become kind of who I am came out of things in my childhood and, and through high school and such. And so my parents were, were successful in a certain type of business. And, and so I learned uh, event planning, and I learned you know lots of details and organizational skills and such, and yeah. and really prepared me for what I do today. Um, I, I remember that all the way growing up, I had been kind of told like, "Hey, we're doing this because you're going to go to college," and you know the kind of the, the the things we in America hear like these are the yeah. things you need to do to to ultimately lead to success. And I remember I got to my senior year. And my parents asked me not to go to college, to, to stay uh, and work in their family business. And I wanted to honor my, my mother and father. Yeah. It, it wasn't necessarily what I had been preparing for. Um, and I really wrestled with it. I really prayed about it. And I was just like, As, I, I don't understand, but I feel like I have to honor my, my mom and dad. I made the decision to do that. And ultimately, it led to a failure that that. I was trying to honor them. Yeah. It wasn't where my life was going and what I was supposed to do. And in that became a very hard year of just trying to wrestle with what what I was supposed to do. So it culminated into um, that not working. And yeah. in the failure of that, it caused me to pivot. And I ended up going to the university that led me to being a concerts chair that led me to Nashville. Yeah. And so... Had that year not happened, and had that really, it was a really hard year, but had that not taken place and the failure of trying to lean into what my parents wanted for me, um, then maybe I wouldn't have went down the road I went down. So that's a perfect example. Yeah. The time was very uncomfortable, <laughs> and I didn't know what ultimately was going to come out of it. But, you know, in the end, it yeah. led me in a path here. Um so, so that's kind of a life example. Uh, in in business, I remember right after I started Q, uh, I was managing Skillet. Um, things were starting to happen there. They had signed to Lava. We were starting to have some success. And anytime yep. you have success, you're going to get other people that you, yeah. that you know want to come talk to you about doing it. X, Y, and Z. And I remember at that time, I, I came across an artist that I just really loved. To this day, I really love that artist. <laughs> and... Uh, and I thought they had something special. And in the end, they did have something special. Um, and we tried to go down a road with that artist. And, and I, was, I was possibly looking at partnering with someone else on managing that artist. And then for whatever reason, at this point, I can't even remember why it unraveled. But it did. It unraveled. And they decided to do something else. And I decided not to end up doing this partnership. Um, and, and that was a mutual thing. And, and out of that, it kind of stung in the sense that you, you're you're thinking, okay, wait a minute, I, I thought I was headed in this direction, and suddenly I wasn't, and so I had to step back and go, okay, why didn't that work? Yep. You know, what what in how we approached that didn't that work? And and in the end, I realized that my strengths were in who I am, 
and not trying to be who else someone wanted me to be or how someone else tried to do things. And, and, and so, you know, that caused me to just kind of reassess and go, okay, hey, I got to be true to who I am. I got to be authentic to my gifts yep. and I'm going to lean into those. And that's going to mean I'm going to get some artists that, you know, that I uh, was looking to try signing and I'm not going to get others because our, our personalities and skill sets aren't matched. Yep. And so, you know, again, it, it was a it was a very defining moment in Q in the sense that I had to step back and go, okay, I can't be X, Y, and Z manager. I can only be Zach Kiln. Yeah. So Yeah. Um life experience wise, it's kind of similar in in some ways, but I when my senior year of high school I um made some bad decisions at the end of it. Um but those bad decisions led me to go to a different college. Uh, university than I had originally just chosen to and led me out of Arizona when you know my dream was I was going to go to NYU or USC or something so I was headed LA or New York you know mm -hmm. and I ended up in a little bitty town in Oklahoma um, but I know if I had not ended up there things would be very different and I was able to see things clearer in that environment and um, definitely it, things were very clear quickly what I wanted to do and what I felt like I should do as far as music and the mix of journalism and music and writing and all that. And um, it, it led me, obviously, ultimately to Nashville. And I don't think that ever would have happened if I had not made that choice, um, which, again, like that choice came from some failures. It wasn't where I was originally planning to be. Um but ultimately, yeah, a good thing, very good thing. And then business-wise, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's probably lots of them. Um, but I think learning from them and trying to figure out, you know, why something happened. You know, PR is interesting because you're constantly pitching different mm -hmm. stories and you're getting yeses sometimes, but a lot of times you're getting no's. And a lot of times that you can take that personally, yeah. you know. So when you get the no's, you know, learning or trying to understand why, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, using that the next time you pitch. Um, and sometimes it's just not a fit, you know, and it's yeah. black and white, but sometimes you gotta think about it a little bit more. So, um, I don't know. That. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so before you guys got fully into music, was there any one thing that was maybe holding you back, something you had to overcome before you could dive completely in? getting hired <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean because yeah on the business side it is a little bit of a different path yeah. but yeah yeah you know what I would say to that is it, it kind of goes along with the failure thing and, and hopefully it speaks to your audience in the sense and in, in when people are trying to figure out like hey what am I supposed to be doing am mm -hmm. I supposed to be leaning in am I supposed to be doing this many times if we're in relationship with you know peers or or uh, or mentors or those mm -hmm. kinds of things many times those are the people that recognize things in us that we don't recognize in ourselves, or we stand in the way of our own selves. And, mm -hmm. and I have one of those very defining moments where I, I was, uh, I think from the last podcast we did, I told the story I was a camp counselor. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't plan to be in music. And there was, a, there was a director at a camp when I was just literally doing concerts as uh, not a career but just as a service and, yep. and, and something that I was, I was good at because I was good at event planning. Mm -hmm. There was a camp counselor, a camp director who recognized in me something I didn't recognize in myself. And he pulled me aside one day, and it was a defining moment in my life. I'll, I'll tell this story until I'm in my grave <laughs> because his recognition of, of a gift that, that God had given me or a talent that, that I had, I didn't necessarily see in myself in the same way. And I'll never forget, he pulled me aside and he said, hey, we've had this plan in place, but you coming back here and, and working every summer and, and possibly down the road, you know, coming on full time. But I see what's happening in you doing these concerts and, and, and your gifting in it. And I just want you to recognize that you might need to be looking in that direction, wow. not because I don't see something for you here, but I think that you're actually supposed to go do this. Had he not yeah. said that, I probably would have continued doing what I was doing and would have stayed in in what my original plan was. But he recognized something that I didn't necessarily see at the time. 
And just the fact that he was willing to step out on a limb and say, hey, I want you to think about this. I want you to look at this. We can continue going down the road that we're planning. I think maybe you, you, there's another plan for you. And, he, and ultimately, he was right. So I think, you know, for, you know, for, for those that are listening to your podcast that are kind of asking that question, like, yeah. what am I supposed to do? What are my giftings? Where, you yeah. know, how far can I actually take this? You know, mentorship is, is, is paramount in having those people that we can lean into that recognize things about us mm-hmm. that, you know, maybe we both positive and negative don't necessarily always see. Um, and being affirming and also being challenging in those in that relationship. And so many times those around us can help us discern where we need to lean in and where we don't. Yeah. So that's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. I'm I'm just taken back. I'm like, okay, well, I'm now inspired. Come on. Uh, Day ahead. Come on. Yeah. Bring it. <laughs> so okay, two more just real quick. So uh, we we kind of brushed on this already a little bit, but is there anything that you guys are doing? in your daily just work that's really working for you right now that our listeners might be able to kind of apply to what they're doing as they're trying to find success in music? Um, well, for us, we have a, we have like a weekly team meeting on Mm -hmm. Mondays where we kind of go through everything that's supposed to happen for the week. And that's pretty important for us to kind of be on the same page and understand kind of the full scope of the week and what's happening here you know why is you know maybe something's not working quite right here it's you know just kind of like looking at all of it and communicating and i mean we have a very small office small team but we're all kind of in the same room so we're constantly communicating and talking through things and working through plans and pitches and stuff and so i think I mean, just communication and communicating with each other with your clients as well mm-hmm. is is key. Um, you know, a lot of times everyone's so busy yeah. that it can be um, easy to skip that step sometimes, I think. And uh, usually when that step gets st- skipped, it's not a good thing. So yeah. I, would, I would say, speaking to myself, even, you know, continuing to communicate and be open and about things, how things are going, you know, I guess it depends on the situation that you're in, but, yeah. but communication and being upfront about things is always positive and helpful. Um, I don't know. It's huh? yeah. For, for me, management is, is almost, you, you can get siloed very easily. You, mm-hmm. you, you kind of have a, a small group or team that you kind of work in that circle a lot, you know, particularly you have, you know, we have a boutique management company, so we have very few clients that we work with. And so you end up working with, you know, those pieces around those clients all the time. Well, just like all of us, we're all busy. And so it's, it's sometimes hard to get out of that group and, and to see what other people are doing and see what best practices are working for other people. So I, I found recently just being able to step out of, you know, kind of the, the, safe and and developed environment yep. that that I've been working in for for so long has been really energizing you know really freeing in the sense of you know just having new conversations approaching things differently talking to different people that are outside of that group that you know I've been doing this a long time now that you just end up getting siloed in yep. whether you realize it or not so for me just networking outside of my group that you know I've kind of been in for a period of time and and continuing trying to push in to meet new people and and meet different people that are doing things in different music and different genres that that to me has been really energizing so mm-hmm. that's awesome i would sort of piggyback on that when it comes to press um you know it's really easy to stay behind your phone or your laptop or whatever yeah. and you just not be face to face with people yeah. anymore um but we've really been trying to make the effort to have more lunches and meetups with media in particular Mm -hmm. because nothing replaces that relationship you know when it when it comes to -to face-to-face personal time with someone um you can't get that through an email and and such and sometimes that's just the way it is you know if it's someone that doesn't live where you live yeah um but just that personal communication and relationship is vital still yeah and probably maybe more vital than ever yeah Putting a, yeah, putting a face with the digital name is, yeah, yeah it's yeah. a huge thing. Yeah. There's so many people we've worked with that it's like, I've never met you, you right. know? And yeah. it's great to have, you know, mixers come in town or whatever and just to be able to, like, connect and sit down and be like, 
you're the guy behind the emails. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right, so last one. So let's say you woke up tomorrow and you still had all your knowledge and all your experiences, but the businesses that you guys have grown are gone and you had to start over completely from scratch. You can do anything you want and you still have all the knowledge, all the experience. What would you guys do? I know what you would do. <laughs> what would I do? I think I know what she's going to say. What would I do? Have something to do with hunting, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, oh, yeah, the... <laughs> yeah I, I mean, I, I'm kind of doing that right now in some sense. I, you know, so I've been in I, I've been in certain genres of music for a long time, uh-huh. and recently I stepped into a new genre of music. Um, and when you do that, you have all the knowledge and all the experience, yeah, yeah. but you're completely on a new playing field. Yeah. New players, uh, new relationships, and all of those people all have worked together yeah. in their respective yeah. genre as well. And so, um, so yeah, I'm, I kind of am doing that as we speak. And, and ultimately, uh, at this point, you know, doing this for 20-something years, I'm loving it. Yeah. It, the challenge of it invigorates me. Yeah. Um, because I don't, I, I, I'm not a person to back away from that. I'm yeah. kind of like one to lean into it. So many times, being able to do that is is really energizing, and and it it brings about new perspectives that can also re-energize what you're already doing. And and I'm not a guy that needs to lack energy. I like I literally love what I do, um, and so I, I I could work 24 seven and literally not get tired. I just don't get tired, <laughs> um, and I just love it. But now I'm literally doing what you're saying. Like, I have 20-something years of doing management and growing artist careers and, you know, being in community with artists, which I love. They're some yeah. of my best friends. You, you do life together. You grow up together. Yeah. And now I'm st- I'm starting all over, really. I might as well be 22 <laughs> and trying to figure out, okay, who is here and who is there and how do I need to connect all of it? Yeah. And so it's fun. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and, and, and if I was completely out of music... I'm a big outdoorsman, as my wife said, and I would, I would find a way to leverage that into hunting in some form or fashion. So she is right. I love it. Many times. Many. <laughs> and again. Um, I'm, I could go in a few directions probably, but um, I we have a son with special needs, and so that's become, you know, obviously something that is important and, yeah. you know, in our daily life. And I probably, you know, would might probably be involved more with his school and, and it, he goes to a great school where there's a lot of little learning not little bit learning um differences and mm-hmm. i love being involved there as much as i can right now even and just understanding it all more um because there's a lot to understand oh, yeah. and so i probably would be more involved there um i love uh, decorating so who knows maybe i would bug a friend of mine that's an interior designer and ask if I could tag along or something because <laughs> that's always fun to me. Um, um, I don't know. Oh. That's a couple things. That's awesome. I yeah. love it. So lastly, how can people interact with you guys or find out more about what you guys do? Do you have websites or social medias? Both. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. both. Yeah. Well, what are, can you guys just give us the addresses real quick? Yeah, the, mine, uh, mine's qmanagementgroup.com. Okay. Um, yeah, people can email me. I, I'm, I, I literally try to answer every email that I get. I, I just feel it's really important. And if I haven't answered your email, I apologize, but I literally do, um, because I remember, I remember being on the other side of that. Yeah. Uh, and so, if people want to email me. Feel free. It's Zach Z A C H at Q Management Group dot com, um, and 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 if I can reply in any way that's helpful, I'll I'll attempt to do so. That's awesome. Yeah, ours is the company is called the Media Collective, but the website is the M Collective. Socials are the M Collective as well because the mediacollective.com was not available at the time. So we know the people, struggle of that. Most as well. people call it the M Collective, <laughs> even though that's not the name. It just kind of sticks because of email addresses and stuff. Because email is velvet at the M Collective or them collective.com or PR at them collective.com. So that's awesome. Yeah. Velvet, Zach. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Made It in Music podcast.